All right. So we're going to go ahead and get the show on the road. Um, thankfully, Joey is a master of many tasks, including MacGyvering how to get the camera up here. Um, we're, we're really thrilled to have everyone here. Um, this is special for me because I've had the pleasure of knowing Brent Heath for uh, pretty much the start of my career in public horticulture when I was at the Ralston Arboretum and we visited and we got bulbs for the Ralston. Um, and it's just been, it's been a delight knowing both he and Becky. Um, I've said many times before in promoting this talk, you could have the worst day, but you run into Brent and Becky and it just is, turns into just a wonderful day. They're just wonderful people. They are wonderful supporters of public horticulture in terms of, you know, giving lectures. Um, as I've always said before, at the end of the season, what didn't sell out, it doesn't go in the trash. It goes to public gardens. So, you know, many of you have benefited when you've walked up in the vegetable gardens, that pathway that you're walking, that almost always is coming from Brent and Becky's. Um, they just have enabled so much joy to come to so many people. Um, I think back, especially to, you know, at the height of COVID when everything else was very dark and we had that wonderful bulb display that just brought a lot of cheer to everyone. Um, that was because of Brent and Becky. So they're, they're near and dear to my heart for what they do. Um, I always say, you know, if people are looking for bulbs, they're a fantastic resource. Um, I always laugh when people are asking about where are my bulbs, that they do not send the bulbs until they're ready to go in the ground. Um, you know, that's part of the education. You go into Lowe's and Home Depot and those things are out in August and it's too hot to plant bulbs. You're not going to get the bulbs from them until they're ready to go in the ground. Um, so they just, they're a fantastic group. Um, you know, we, we always delight in going up and visiting. You know, I think you have bulb days to go up and visit the Daffodil Festival. They're in Gloucester, Virginia. Um, it's just a wonderful area to visit. Um, you know, one of the other programs that I do, don't want to forget about is this, this program called Bloom and Bucks. And it's a simple thing. When you go to buy bulbs, you can designate Renolda Gardens as your recipient and a percentage of your order actually goes as a credit back to the garden so we can get more bulbs. So I think, I can't remember if it's 25%. So it's an, you know, you're getting joy for your garden and at the same time you're supporting Ronaldo Garden. So it's a win-win. Um, but I don't want to take up too much time. You know, the only thing I would say is coming up, we do have another lecture next Tuesday on, um, basically water wise landscapes after that i think on april 9th i think that's the tuesday we have the plant sale preview talk which you know that's kind of the behind the scenes of what you don't want to miss um and as we always say if you're a friend of Ronaldo gardens you can pre-order and not miss out on those things we've seen so many people show up on saturday and going where is such and such and well it's sold out um, so it's an easy way to get uh, early access to those plants. And of course, the plant sale is Saturday, April 20th from 8 to 2. Um, and that's a big driver of revenue for the gardens and keeps us uh, doing what we do out here. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Brent Heath. Um, and this is definitely, I'm so glad we've got a great turnout because it's a lecture not to miss. Here's your, let me get that in your collar. Well, I'm delighted to be here and thank you, John. And, you know, the last time I was here was probably about 35 years ago. I came and gave a lecture. The things have changed a little bit in that amount of time. It's awesome what's happening here. I've had a wonderful tour this morning and seen all the beautiful gardens. I, um, I, I do have a PhD. You may not know that, but I'm a PhD is this. When you push this button here, this little white dot comes up. And if you look closely, it says push here, dummy. I took a lot of pictures today and maybe even a few of, I used to use a real camera, but it's awesome. Took a lot of pictures today um, in any event. Delighted that you've had me. Now I'm here because of John's wonderful invitation, but I'm here also because I was well-born. Any of you well-born? You know, that means born into bucks. Um, 
And I wasn't born into bucks, I was born into bulbs. My grandfather was a damn Yankee. Any of you damn Yankees? Oh, come on now, you admit it. Okay, you'll understand that that means that you have been accepted. You're no longer a Yankee, okay? My grandfather retired to New York City, born in Brookline, Massachusetts. He ate a cantaloupe that was so good in his retirement. He asked the grocer to bring, bring him, a, order him a case a week. The gentleman farmer in Virginia was so pleased that this Yankee gentleman liked his cantaloupe. He put a note in the case of cantaloupe inviting my grandfather to come for a visit. He got on the next steamer and came south and visited Thomas Dixon uh, at, at Dixon Dale, lovely old Georgian uh, plantation on the Mob Jack Bay in Virginia, uh, in the lower part of the Chesapeake. And he fell in love with the area. He ended up buying another plantation called Auburn, a lovely plantation that John and Yoko bought, unfortunately, the week before he was killed. But um, it had five, 600 acres, lovely old Georgian house, and um, it had a steamboat landing. And my, my grandfather noticed um, he'd been in the consular service in Europe. He was interested in horticulture and agriculture, and he saw ladies. Now, you girls differ from us guys, and aren't we guys glad that you, you do? Uh, um, but you differ in many ways, and one of them is your way of thinking. Um, and often it's your way of dress, or it used to be in the way of dress. Uh, any of you have a skirt on today or a dress? Well, in any event, my grandfather noticed ladies picking daffodils. And by the way, you pick daffodils. You run your finger down the stem, you put your thumb next to it, you pull up and snap, you get a nice solid white stem. Never cut them because the stem will be hollow and won't hold water. Your flowers will last longer if you pick them instead of cut them. In any event, ladies had been picking their daffodils, bringing them down to the steamboat landing to ship them to Baltimore where their cousins sold them on the street corner and then forwarded them on to New York City where they sold on the street corner. Well, my grand and these are little daffodils that your great great grandmas brought with them in the hems of their skirts because faced with an ocean voyage to follow their husbands coming to a land of opportunity on a sailing ship, they weren't allowed much room, but um, they couldn't bring a green plant and an ocean voyage, it wouldn't survive, but they could bring a dormant bulb. So you all think differently than we do. And you sew, you had limited space, so what did you do? You sewed them into the hems of your skirts. When you went up on deck for fresh air and served a double duty, it kept your skirts from blowing up. In any event, they brought this little daffodil called pseudo narcissus, uh, proper Latin terminology, nickname. By the way, we shouldn't call plants common, they're nicknames. Um, nickname, where it's wild in France, is called trumpet major, translated from French. Um, when the Romans took it to Great Britain with them, uh, the Brits called it the Lent lily um, because it blooms about Lent season. And when the ladies brought it to Virginia and it naturalized, which means a non-native plant that reseeds, not one that just comes back well, um, they called it early Virginia. So um, also in the, in the country of Wales, uh, it became St. David's favorite flower. So proper name, of course, is Narcissus, and it became, uh, St. David's flower became Daffodil, the nickname for Narcissus. But we'll get there in a minute. In any event, my grandfather saw ladies picking these flowers. He'd seen modern hybrids in Europe, in Holland, England. The majority of the hybrids were coming from England, registered with the Royal Horticulture Society. But he brought modern hybrids here, King Alfred, Carlton, Fortune, uh, those names may be emperor, may be familiar to some of you around the turn of the century. And he began to sell the bulbs to local farmers, the tidewater sandy soil. You all have lovely sandy soil here too, right? In any event, they grew very well and they began picking the flowers and shipping them, making good money in the spring. 
By the time the Depression came, Gloucester County grew more daffodils than anywhere in the country. So that's the story of the beginning. Um, now, uh, I was well born. My father picked up the business from my grandfather. Uh, he married well. He married a smart woman. He married my mother. She ran the business. Um, and then uh, after a starter marriage, uh, I met one of my children's school teachers. And she caught my fancy right away. It took me a long time to catch her attention. But once I did, and she agreed to join me, I married well. Um, and I realized I really was not set out to run a business. Um, I was more interested in people and also in plants. My first job out of college, running a summer camp for children. I'm sitting next to this lovely lady here comes and he says, um, were you at nature camp with me? <laughs> and we discovered years ago, but she's a lot younger than I am. But any event, anyhow, um, nature camp was wonderful because I got to learn how to help people look at the world around us and realize that you know, you can see it with your eyes, you can hear it with your ears, you can smell it, you can taste it if you're so willing, and there's some interesting flavors, um, but also you can touch it. So we taught fingertips to see, and that was my first job. After four years, my mother wanted to sell the business, and an aunt died and left me enough money to buy it, and I bought it. So um, here I am today, uh, because I was well-born, I <laughs> married well, and uh, but I'm going to take you through four seasons using flower bulbs. But I hope that you'll envision how to weave flower bulbs into the, into the fabric of your garden amongst your annuals, perennials, ground covers, trees, shrubs, and even vegetables. It's so awesome what this young man here is doing with vegetables and, and showing kids, and he's combining flower bulbs with them too. So in any event. I'm going to go pretty quickly. Please stop me if you have a question. Please don't wait until the end. Um, because somebody else will have the same question. They're just too shy to ask. But um, also, my, this, my wife created a slide list that each of you can follow along. It's got all those names. All you have to do is just check them off. You don't have to write them down. So we're going to start in the winter. And... Now, I married my opposite. My son says we're each other's completer. She's musician, school teacher. I'm dyslexic. I have attention deficit, and I'm a plant collector. But you'll see, we each have separate gardens. It's easier that way. Um, so we'll tell you. This is Becky's garden in January. That's a little daffodil. Now, a little daffodil. Proper name for daffodil? Narcissus. The word comes from the Greek stem narcos. You may think of some other terms that come from narcos, narcotic, narcolepsy. You know, the alkaloid and narcissus bulbs, when ingested, can cause a narcotic stupor, but then death. But it would take a bushel to kill somebody, but they taste so damn bad, nobody wants to eat them. So they're in the amaryllis plant family, and most amaryllis plant family members have this alkaloid it tastes really bad. But a little one is wild in Spain and Portugal. Um, this little one blooms extremely early, has a marvelous fragrance, but it's pretty cold like it is today here. This one would be a happy camper. But um, lovely fragrance. And if there are any early bees out or pollinators out, it draws them and it does set seed. And in setting seed, the seed spreading and coming up, that's called naturalizing. A lot of people use the term naturalize simply for a plant that likes to grow well, but it, if it spreads, it naturalizes. Now, here it is up close, a you know, lovely little, it little, it's only three inches tall, but you want a rock garden or a berm or some place that may elevate it. It's a great one for growing on pots also. Notice I said growing on pots. I said that because most bulbs, and I did say most, not all, most bulbs go want to be planted at least three times their height deep, 
said bulb an inch tall goes that deep? Three inches, okay. Bulb two inches tall goes six inches. So, you know, easy to dig a hole, uh, six inches, but you know, you wanna see a, an easy way to plant the bulbs? I use, I come armed. They take me, they tell me to put my arms back in the car uh, when I go to a movie theater and I forget to take it off. But in any event, you know, recognize this tool? It's a bulb planting trowel. It was maybe borrowed from a hoary, hoary knife or whatever you call those things. But in any event, bulb planting trowel. How do you hold most trowels? Like this, right? Do you dig holes like this? If you dig many holes, you'll develop something called carbal tunnel. So instead, treat this tool like you mean business. Take it like that. You'll notice they're one, two, three, four inches on there. And when you get ready to plant, your strength is in your arm and your shoulder. Use that to stab down, stab it to the right depth, pull it to you, drop a little bulb in the hole. Well, I'll demonstrate more as we go. So um, in any event, the bulb trail is awesome. Now, I talked about bulbs that were inedible, but they're also bulbs which are critter proof, but they're also bulbs that are critter resistant. Now, every critter in the world loves crocuses squirrels, rabbits, voles, deer. Notice I said voles and not moles. Moles are carnivores. They don't eat bulbs. They don't, they eat insects and animals. Um, but every crocus smells like a nut. If you were to come into our bulb storage room, you would get a very nice nut aroma of the crocus storage. So critters smell things a thousand times better than we do. How do they locate those bulbs underground? They smell them. Well, mask that fragrance, and I'll show you that in a minute. But the good Lord did create some crocuses that don't have that nut smell. And this little one with the funny name, uh, Thomasini, A-N-U-S, how do you pronounce that? Oh, come on, don't be bashful. Uh, I, I once called a Thomasini anus and a, and a taxonomist corrected me immediately and he said, in honor of Mr. Thomas means Thomas any honest in honor of, okay? But lovely little crocus that naturalizes and the critters don't like it. This one you can put in your yard, they're not lawn because they don't like those pre-emergent herbicides. They don't like mindless irrigation. They don't like all the fertilization you do. But in any event, in your yard with chemical free and no mindless, but look, they're blooming with the hellebores. So hellebores often want company. Isn't it nice to have the two things blooming together? All right, we'll go quickly now. Now, the good Lord didn't create that one crocus in one color. In the species, there are often variations in color. Now, one of my friends uh, in the Netherlands, because that's where the majority of the bulbs are produced, and I'll show you our bulb fields there in a little bit, but one of my friends noticed a purple flowering form. But you know, it's a pity, but most Dutch people are colorblind. And they also, they also don't have a size perception. They call this a giant, ruby giant. <laughs> in any event, it, I put hearts in front of all my favorites in the catalog, and this is one of my favorites because uh, the clumps get bigger every year. And it doesn't naturalize the way the species does, but in any event, it's still a great. And there, it's planted with a lovely little iris called Iris reticulata pauline, and also in the same bed with cyclamen heterifolium. The name heterifolium, ivy-leafed uh, cyclamen, and they, they all belong in bed together. They're great bed mates or companions. And now, Next, I go to my favorite plant, Narcissus, right? What's the nickname for Narcissus? Daffodil. Now, any of you call other call daffodils and Narcissus by any other nicknames? Yeah, John Quills. Well, you know why you call them John Quills? Because your great grandma from Southern Spain or France brought with her Narcissus John Quilla, whereas from Northern Europeans, brought 
the more trumpet or poeticus types. Um, and the 13 different types of Narcissus, and one of the favorites is this little one up here called Narcissus jonquilla. Notice the very narrow leaves and multiple flowers and extremely sweetly fragrant. The French used to make a perfume from that one. And um, unfortunately, when bigger ones came, your great grandmas called them by the wrong name. They thought there were more jonquillas, but they, they, they are, they are jonquilla type narcissus instead of trumpet type narcissus or, or a double narcissus, or we'll show you some of the others. But they also like being planted with companions that follow them in succession. So coming up through that sedum angeloi, one of my angel, angelina, not loi, uh, one of my favorites, they, they're wonderful coming up through that. And then the sedum, when the daffodil finishes blooming and the leaves begin to turn yellow, the sedum continues to grow and keeps the daffodils dry in their summer dormancy. Now, this is important for most spring flowering bulbs. They'd like to sleep in a dry bed, just like you and I do. So mindless irrigation in the summertime, don't want to plant your bulbs where you're going to be watering them every whip stitch when the water and the soil is saturated already. They'll catch a fungus and they'll rot. The daffodils are immune to almost all pests. However, they're susceptible to a fungus when they get stressed. And if you lose, ever lose your daffodils, that's the major reason you lose them in any event. But I like to couple my daffodils in February gold, nice name for the time of the year of that one blooming with the chinomalies. And they're so amazing. Chinomalies are quince these days. So fun to combine those two things. Now you're here today because some person who wanted to positively impact your life took you out into the yard with a spade, dug a hole, gave you two different types of bulbs and you planted them in a pattern, or even let you write your name in bulbs in the, in the yard. And then this is what happened later in the spring. Isn't that awesome? Uh, why not? Every kid loves a happy face and so easy to do. And it was so neat to see your kids part of the garden with so many fun things going on. In any event, these come back pretty well most, most all the time. But you've got to leave those solar collectors, the leaves, to gather enough sunlight along with the carbon dioxide they take out of the air, along with the minerals that they bring up from the soil. Solar collectors, that's what the leaves are. They make the starches and sugars, and that's what bulbs are. And we call the bulbs the batteries. They need to leave those solar collectors long enough to recharge the batteries in the sun. Now, crocus are somewhat shade tolerant because they get a lot of their light before the leaves come on the trees. And there are some shade tolerant plants. I'll show you those as well. But cut your grass high the first two times, two or three times, three, three and a half inches. That allows those leaves to remain intact and recharge. So you can have that come back year after year. Now, some bulbs are edible. So what do you do to protect them? We find the best thing. We use no chemicals in our operation, um, but we do use some repellents. And I guess probably the surfactant, which is a soap-like thing that which makes things stick to leaves. And um, that may be considered a chemical, but almost chemical-free then I'll say. This is, and it's organic. This is slaughterhouse waste. You gals will not like the smell of it. It stinks pretty bad to you. Well, you're the gatherers. We guys are the hunters. Doesn't bother us at all. But in any event, it goes away pretty quickly. However, if you let it dry on the bulb, the critters won't smell it. And if you also spray the bulb as it's coming up, like tulips or deer candy. But if you spray it just as it's coming out of the ground and they taste one, they won't come back and eat the rest of them. Okay? Now... Your other option is, remember the bulb trowel? Well, do any of you have bacchusandra in your garden? Well, or ground covers? You know, they're pretty damn tough plants. They don't mind having you stab in and pull and drop a bulb. Now, they go three times the width apart also. So bulbs typically about 
an inch wide, go three inches apart, that's 10 bulbs to the square foot. Those are the little bulbs we call shoes and socks in the garden. At bigger bulbs, daffodils and tulips, typically go about six inches apart. They're four bulbs to the square foot. But uh, right, remember just stab, pull, drop, stab, pull, drop. And okay, let's keep going. Galanthus, snowdrops in the amaryllis plant family. What's important about the amaryllis plant family? Uh, every amaryllis plant family member is quitter proof, has the alkaloids in it. Snowdrops, proper name Galanthus, nickname Snowdrop. They are visited by pollinators and they do set seed and they do naturalize freely when they're in their happy spot, but they, they want to be in their happy spot. You know, I kill plants. Do you ever kill plants? Well, I do too, but I never kill them twice in the, or try never to kill them twice in the same spot. Sometimes I forget, but um, you know, there's so many microclimates and different growing situations. Try it until you find its happy spot and then plant it there in any event. Lovely, shade tolerant. So many people say, well, there weren't any leaves on the trees when it bloomed, but it's after they bloom that they get the shade that cuts down on that solar collector doing its job. So um, plant things that are shade tolerant. We let you know that in the catalog. Um, and they're great in ground covers, etc. I call these little bulbs that are under six inches tall shoes and socks or the carpet in the garden because they can be a carpet around trees and shrubs. They can be a carpet around later perennials. You know what else that does? You know, seed germination, those plants that we love, those little wildflowers called chickweed and henbit and dead nettle and, and uh, all those, they need sunlight to germinate. So what does mulch do? It keeps them from germinating. Well, the, the ground covers do as well, the carpeting ground covers. Anemones are fun. We're calling a lot of plants that aren't true bulbs, bulbs because they are starchy storage organs. So a lot of the vegetables that you eat, the onions are true bugs, bulbs. I think beets are true bulbs there, but a lot of them are tubers, rhizomes, tuberous roots, and um, things like that. This one is a is a is a rhizome, and they don't have pointy end up. You know, you tell people which end to put up. We'll plant the pointy end up. If it's not exactly up, it's on its side. The contractile roots will right it. But this one, there's a definite top and bottom. They're pretty flat and hard to tell top from bottom. So when you go to plant them, it's like when you load dishes in a dishwasher. You don't load them in this way that would block the water and they wouldn't all get clean. You tip them up on edge, right? So tip these on edge and for sure then you won't put them upside down. But anemones are marvelous, the little anemone blanda. And about 10 per square feet. They do come in a variety of colors. The honeybees love them. Gloucester is a colonial uh, county in Virginia on the lower part of the Chesapeake Bay bordered by York River, Yorktown across the river. And actually our independence was won in Gloucester County when our local Gloucester militia cut off Cornwallis' supply line and he surrendered because he could no longer feed his troops. Well, that's not the whole story, but that is part of it that didn't get in the history book. But uh, our symbol is the beehive. And it's where Pocahontas supposedly staved John Smith's neck because her daddy's chiefdom where he ruled the whole Algonquin nation was in Gloucester County called Werowicomico, becoming a national park. Majority of our bulbs go to public gardens around the country. This is Winterthur Museum. People go there for the wonderful um, American furniture collection, but wow, they ought to see the March Walk. 20 acres of woods with little bulbs that have naturalized. And this could not come up through the big leaf duff so what do most people do with leaves? They rake them up, put them on the street corner, the city takes them away. Luckily, the, fortunately, the city's mandated to make compost out of them now. But better thing and easy thing to do, which I learned from winter tour years ago, put those serrated blades on your mower and chop them up fine because then the seeds of this get enough uh, light to germinate and look what it's done. Isn't that a marvelous carpet in the woods? So chop up those leaves in the fall and it's a possibility. 
uh, Tionodoxa, Glory of the Snow, its nickname, lovely. It comes in a variety of pink, white, and purple, and blue colors. So um, it's fun. Now, invasive plants. Have you heard that term? Well, John and I driving around, and, and I think there are a few plants here that, you know, you might not want to have here that uh, they're working hard. He's, he's enabled a lot of people to come in and apparently help you guys here with this wonderful place. Uh, other organizations, and uh, I didn't realize it was part of a camp uh, campus either. Any any event, Park Service calls this an invasive plant. I love it. Any of you guys arrange flowers? With a benefit to arranging flowers. If you're invited out to dinner, pick a bunch of leaves of this, which come out in October, and they last all winter long. It's an Italian arum. It's not native. Some people are saying any plant that's not native that reproduces is invasive, and I, I think we've stepped overboard. The pendulum has swung too far. There are some definitely invasive plants, but this one may be a bit promiscuous, and I'll explain that term in a little bit. But in any event, uh, these leaves in a vase of water and pick some other spring, early spring things, they hold them in place, and you give it to your hostess, you'll get invited back next week again. So a little clue. Um, but in any event, winter leaves of interest. They don't mind the cold. They lie down on the ground when it gets real cold. They pop back up when it warms up. In the spring, you get a chartreuse spathe. The pollinators like them, so they do get pollinated. And then in the summertime, they form check in the pulpit like fruits. Well, it's the same plant family member, highly critter resistant. However, mockingbirds do enjoy eating those fruits. When that seed goes through their digestive tract, it loses its waxy cutilage and it can germinate. So if you don't want them to naturalize, take the fruits off. Don't let the mockingbirds eat them. But I love the plant. Another non-native that we think is awesome. Now, the majority of the bulbs I'm showing you are from the um, Northern Hemisphere and many from Europe and Asia. This one from the Southern Hemisphere from up in the Andes. Cute little bulb, this winter tour museum again in their orchard. It's a great grass com combination or yard combination. Very much grass-like leaves. When crushed, smells a little like garlic breath, so nobody wants to eat it. But, uh, has little star-like flowers like that. Comes in white, pink, purple, and it not only naturalizes, but uh, I, I think it's an awesome little plant. And I like different flower forms together. And I think that, you know, Becky has an all-white garden, but everything there is white in the leaves, variegated, or white flowers. But when you combine two different flowers that bloom at a similar time, now how do you do that? If you look in the catalog, we do tell you that they are early, early mid-season, or they're very early, early, early mid-season, mid-season, late mid-season, late, very late, etc. And if you match two different flowers in the same season, they should overlap and bloom. The world's most numerous daffodil, this little one called tete -a Majority of the bulbs that are raised in the Netherlands are raised for cut flowers and pot plants. We gardeners are using only 20% of the bulbs that are grown. But this little one is ideal for growing on pots. You may see it in the grocery store, tete a tete. That name comes because when Germany, I, when Germany invaded Holland, the French underground came to help. And the Germans really appreciate the French. They're not so fond of the Germans, but they name a lot of their, their plants with French names. So we call the Dutch people Francophiles, tete a tete, head to head, with the little anemone, fun combination. And um, yeah. when I plant, again, I disturb the soil. What happens when you disturb the soil? You, the good Lord, has many, many weed seeds, and every time you expose them to light, they have a chance to germinate. So I put what I want there. And I use viola seeds in the fall. It's a biennial, but they bloom in the spring and they're wonderful and they do naturalize for us. I do like one seed company because I can buy seeds very inexpensively. It's not North Carolina, it's South Carolina. 
Now, you're the valley of humility, right? Between two mountains of conceit. Well, South Carolina thinks one of the mountains of conceit, but there's a marvelous nursery there called Twilly, T-W-I-L-L-Y nursery. It's a wholesale nursery. It's George Park Jr. who, when he left Park Seed Company, started this. But you buy a packet of seeds in most places, you get 100 seeds for five bucks, you get 1,000 seeds for five or 10 bucks, amazing. Um, and then you have enough seeds to broadcast. So I often intercede in all my plantings. Um, high essence, you either love them or hate them. Um, a friend picked one recently and said, oh, gave me a headache right away. Well, other people think it's a marvelous fragrance, but the neat thing about this plant is they're little soldiers, they stand upright. If you buy bulbs that are too big, they're floppy headed, they fall over. But um, we sell the 15, 16 centimeter bulbs. That's the, 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 the distance in diameter around the bulb. And uh, they tend to stand up well, but um, you know, they come in every color in the rainbow and uh, the next year, they won't be quite as big as they were where the wild ones grow in the Middle East, but um, they can be perennial. I have them in my garden where some varieties just coming back year after year, but I like to combine them in my perennial beds. See, I like them having with the lilies also coming follow. I want sequences in my beds, and Becky does as well. We do lasagna-like plantings. Um, we've also got a... a Polymonium there, uh, stairway to heaven or whatever you call that. But uh, we always want to, and we want to fill our beds. Uh, we don't want plants standing alone. If they're side by side, they seem to be happy and you get a lot less weeds that way. Now, tulips. Well, probably this is the second largest crop in the Netherlands. Uh, daffodils are third, but uh, lilies are first. But uh, I love them. The early blooming ones are fragrant. The critters love them. As soon as they come out of the ground, you need to spray them with some repellent. But, um, and their bulbs put them. But you see, they're coming up with peonies, right? With peony foliage, which will hide them and also help keep them drier in their dormancy. Because tulips absolutely need to stay dry. If they stay wet in the summer, they catch a fungus and rot. Some tulips are better than others, and I'll show you in a minute some of those. Uh, people love the combinations I make in my garden. You know, I think dandelions are lovely little wildflowers. I don't wonder why people spray them. You know, that's one of the most nutritious vegetables you can eat because their roots go down two or three feet. They bring up a lot of minerals from the subsoil, and they're really good for your garden as well. So, you know, I, but I'm different. I, now, you've got another garden south of you. Well, Brook Green Gardens in Merrill's Inlet, South Carolina, the fun bulb garden. I, we've been doing, we planted over 2 million bulbs there over the years. And um, it's, it, this is what they do with Darwin hybrid tulips. Elevate whenever you can. You see, that provides better drainage. And the Darwin hybrid tulips tend to be the most perennial. Yes. And, and sweetheart, if you have plenty of energy, if after those leaves begin to turn yellow and begin to turn yellow, they're losing that photosynthesis, but do it while they're still intact. Dig them and store them dry. Now with bulbs, never wash a bulb. Soil is filled with wonderful microorganisms, particularly if you feed your soil organic matter of bacteria and those fungi, they're beneficial ones and they'll protect that bulb. Just dry it really well, don't store them wet and keep them warm, warm, warm. So in a warm garage hanging in mesh bags and they these are the ones that um, may be difficult to come back. In New England and in, up in the upper Midwest, they are more perennial than here. But, um, they, they want to be dry in the summertime. And in the Pacific Northwest, where they have that Mediterranean dry summer, they do well as well. But um, I love the Darwin hybrids. They tend to go well. They last for a long time in bloom. They're mid-season bloomers. And look, they've even got a little bit of lettuce coming up there and, and uh, other little shoes and socks bulbs. 
Anyhow, let's move on. Now, Becky and I have been blessed. One of my mentors, my father was 60 when I was born. Whoops, I was a little bit of a surprise. But in any event, when I was old enough to buy the business from my mother, my father was gone. Um, but, you know, his friends mentored me. And it was so amazing. One of them taught me about hybridizing. As I had ideas, I liked some daffodils better than others. I thought some were showier. Some lasted longer in bloom. Some had prettier foliage. Some were fragrant. These were all things I was looking for. And I would pick a mama. And uh, she had that little long thing sticking out of her cup called a pistol, the female organ. And I would pick a smaller but multi-flowering little one, hopefully that was fragrant. And I would put her pollen, because all flowers are feminine gender, right? You know that? Isn't that neat? They name all flowers feminine gender. <laughs> we guys lost out there. Anyhow, um, but I take a pollen and put it on her pistol. That's a series of little tubes that goes back to her inferior ovary. Now, you ladies all have superior ones, but uh, that, that pollen grain gets in the tube in that pistol and grows all the way back to her ovary where it selects an ovule or an ovule selects it and turns it into a seed. That black shiny seed harvested about six weeks after bloom, planted, comes up like a grass leaf the first year. It's five to seven years from seed to bloom. But you're patient, aren't you? You're willing to wait. That's why bulbs are not produced from seeds. They're produced by division. Every time a bulb blooms, it initiates a new growth bud. So you start with one bulb, next year you have two, and then four, and then eight, and then 16, 32, 64. And sometimes you think you need to dig and divide them. Well, it's a possibility too. You can do that. Wait until the leaves begin to turn yellow on the tips or begin to fall over. Take a spade, lift the clump, shake the soil off, and plant them right back. The difficult part is storing them over the summer. Again, mesh bag in a place with plenty of air circulation if you need to hold them, but you can plant them right back again. In any event, this was a result of one of our crosses. I think I only made about half a million crosses over a period of about 20 years. And uh, Becky kept all the records. And um, this one called Golden Echo, it's Jonquilla hybrid, so it has the fragrance one of the longest lasting in bloom. And Becky does color echo things in her garden. You like the term color echo, where one flower picks up the color of another? And there we've got golden echo with a with a lovely golden tulip and, and a white hyacinth. Now, I love this. Now, I have a lot of things that happen by chance in my garden. Now, by the time I planted the chinomalies in the fall, I'd forgotten I had a patch of a pink charm daffodil. Now, you know, most pink daffodils are salmon, peach, or apricot. They're not the blue shades of pink you see in those Photoshop catalogs where it's baby pink. But um, I like that color echo there. Um, okay, ground covers are excellent to put little bulbs in. Remember again, the stab pull drop right into the ground cover and uh, they work well. And I like them with ornamental grasses. Now I leave my ornamental grass longer than Becky does. Becky thinks she ought to chop them off when the winter hits, but I leave mine because I kind of like, I don't know, I think yellow and that, um, that goes together, but in any event, we don't always agree. That daffodil was introduced the same year I was, 1945. I registered with the Royal Horticulture Society, given to me by one of my mentors, and I had many mentors, mentors friends of my father's. It doesn't multiply as rapidly as others. There's only one grower growing it, but it's the longest lasting in bloom. So it costs more than others. Some are very inexpensive, but that's because they multiply rapidly and a lot of growers are growing them, keeping the price lower. But this is gets a heart in front of it in the catalog because it's lasting so long. It's, I think, worth the difference. So, uh, Ceylon was, is now called Sri Lanka. So, and I like this one a lot, Monol. But look, it's blooming with Forsythia. Do you grow Forsythia in your garden? It was named for somebody named Forsyth, not Forsa. Anyhow, do you ever take a daffodil to a daffodil show? Well, I went to one at Lewis Ginter Botanic Garden last weekend, and I got to award 500 ribbons. <laughs> that's what that's what a bulb that's what a show is about: awarding, giving ribbons. So 
that was fun. And tomorrow I'll do one in Virginia Beach for the Garden Club of Virginia and uh, get to do it again. So Becky enables me to do all the fun things. Um, she runs the business. I get to play with people and plants. Uh, anyhow, uh, one of the best daffodils given to me by one of my mentors is this accent, a pink daffodil. But look, I have Santalina coming up. Dual purpose, the gray leaves with the white and the pink work really well, but also keeping the daffodil dry in its dormancy, keeping the weeds down. I love the spirea in bloom in the spring, but great with the thalia daffodil and the foxtrot tulip. The ornamental grasses are wonderful. This is Red Butte Gardens in Salt Lake City. Majority of our bulbs go to public gardens around the country. And, um, and actually under that, there's a nepeta also. So really wonderful. And they've, this daffodil is out in the garden down there. It's called Premier. And again, one of my favorites, one of the best big yellows. You know, yellow is the first color your eye separates from the spectrum. That's why they paint cool buses yellow. Um, and then this one, um, I'm trying to remember why I did this. Oh, this is Becky's garden, I see. Becky has Cherokee heritage. Becky's, fan, Becky's background is North Mountains of North Carolina. Her grandma stayed behind her in the Trail of Tears and married into a white family when the mother died and had a second generation of Becky's grandmother. But anyhow, um, this is Becky's garden, Becky's river of daffodils. And you notice the camellia, the, the magnolias, I got crab apples. Um, Becky's garden is eight acres of 21 different themed idea garden rooms where we try to utilize a lot of the bulbs. Now, big mistake we made there. Well, I like woody plants and I got friends who breed woody plants and I brought a lot of magnolias and crab apples. Well, they make shade, don't they? The daffodils are not as prolific today as they were uh, 20 years ago when we planted this, but in any event, uh, it's still a beautiful garden. Yeah, I love combinations of different kinds of bulbs together, and the heathers work beautifully. And this one, the, the grape hyacinths, they're the shoes and socks. Proper name for grape hyacinths, muscari. And one, this one, muscari, oh, baby's breath. I got to name this one. You know, some of my Dutch friends, you're going through and they're showing you something new, and they say, what'd be a good name for it? And actually, I didn't. Becky did. Becky said baby's breath. <laughs> That's the name. So uh, this one is one of our miniatures. And this one is a really good one for growing on pots like tete-a-tete. -tete. There's never been a white tete-a-tete. -tete. They were looking for one. So this one will be the next white tete-a-tete, -tete, perhaps. And there it is in bed with Angelina again. Um, it opens sort of a soft yellow, but then... You know, I I opened up with sort of reddish brown hair, but I'm maturing to white. Well, this one matures to white. And the flowers don't always stay the same color. And then we believe that we live in the best country in the world. I have been, I've been blessed to travel around the world uh, looking for bulbs, et cetera, um, in many different places around the world. And I'm always happy to come home. We love our freedoms. We're so thankful that we have them. And um, it's important we all uh, pay attention to our country and what's happened. Becky likes crazy damn plants that I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have that damn plant in my garden. <laughs> it was beautiful driving down here along your highways with the, with the um, red buds and the maple just leafing out. And then this, the blue, the but that requires more maintenance, but she loves it with the, with the anemones. This is anemone carnaria, the florist anemone. And again, soak your anemones overnight before you plant them and they'll germinate quicker, but uh, fun. And you pull these out of the ground, they just pull away from the tuber. So now I told you, we took our growing operation to the Netherlands in the late, late, um, late seventies because we discovered growers there who wanted to grow our new daffodil hybrids and a lot of the older ones we'd collected. At one point, I had 10,000 different varieties of daffodils and um, it got to be a little problematic with Becky because they weren't, there was Becky and I and not many other teammates to take care of them. <laughs> and uh, she finally persuaded me when a couple of the Dutch guys came over and wanted them to let them to work out a deal where they would grow our daffodils 
for us. And then when we uh, couldn't sell all they were growing, they could sell them to other people. So now you see our daffodils and everybody else's catalog as well, which is fine. We get a little bit of a royalty on them. But this was one of our hybrids. There were 500 sisters. And I had to select which were the best ones. Well, there were three distinct different colors. Well, I selected 20 of each color and then grew them another season. And um, from then, we narrowed it down to maybe one or two of each. So we now have sunlight sensation, moonlight sensation, and starlight sensation. And this is in a polder in the lake in the northwest corner of Holland, where they have a very long, cool growing season and three meters below sea level. You often can see sailboats uh, going by on the horizon there. And there above you, <laughs> there's a dike between us in any event. Um, a very great sandy soil. We've evolved to a culture where we add about three inches of compost a year. So we'll dig these bulbs, and I say we, the grower who's growing them. Um, he will add uh, about three inches of compost, and then he'll plant a crop of carrots. And then the next year, he'll grow wheat. So we don't grow the same plant family in the same, uh, you know, we find diversity works a whole lot better. And I do that in my garden as well. But this one, the beauty of it is that's 10 bulbs. If you counted the number of blossoms, there are over a hundred blooms from ten blossoms there, because each each bulb produces three bloom stalks, and they're fragrant, and the foliage is very nice. It's narrow and it's dark green. So, this is one of our real winners. And I went spent the night with John and Adrian last night. They have this in their woods, and it's been there about five years now. So I'm really pleased to see that. Um, yeah, we're a throwaway nation, aren't we? We create a lot of trash. We throw away a lot of trash. We build mountains out of it. In Holland, they make money out of it. They don't throw anything away. You get a fine if you put the wrong kind of trash in the wrong co colored trash can. But here, Becky has a repurposed part of the garden. You know, it's reuse, recycle, and repurpose. Well, she took my sailboat. I ruptured my lower discs about the same time she broke free and ruptured her bottom instead of going to the dump. She protects the bulbs from critters. So, now, you all garden on lovely sandy loam like I do. Becky, however, gardens a mile away that I do from heavy gray model clay with crawdad tunnels all over it. And, um, it's difficult. It grew good corn, wheat, and soybeans in a dry year, but she has taken that, and with the addition of a foot of compost, and compost is dirt cheap when you buy it from your mun municipality, um, and she created a a drain a, a drain field meadow that was for our septic system, the only place where it drained. She planted. Uh, daffodils and then plugs of ornamental grasses and perennials. So this is the spring and six months later, the same garden. Um, it's amazing the difference that it can be. There's so many wonderful perennials that are great pollinator plants that are good for the environment. And, um, you know, not all plants, we can use plants that are not native. I think it's, you should have a good percentage of plants that are native not necessarily just for pollinators, but for the larval food sources. However, I think diversity is important. And so um, I do think we should uh, plant as many natives as we can, but also plant incredible other plants. Um, I love tulips. This little tulip is a European tulip called Sylvestrin, a woodland tulip. It's great with Father Gillow, a native shrub. The pollinators love it, it naturalizes. It's at Monticello, Mount Vernon. Uh, it's Oatlands Plantation, a lot of the historic gardens around. This little tulip is a French tulip. And you see what's keeping it away from critters? Stackies or lamb's ears, those fuzzy leaves. Critters don't like to go in them. So that works well together and it keeps the bulbs dry. New York Botanic Garden is one of our biggest and best gardens over the years. You'll see in a little bit my son Jay planting bulbs with a bulb machine. 
plants 30,000 bulbs an hour. He's planted half a million bulbs at New York Botanic Garden. And uh, he does a lot around the country now. But this, we, we partnered with the Garden Club, the Garden Club of America Club uh, in, in, from Greenwich, Connecticut. And we planted a daylily daffodil walk, an ideal sequential garden with daylilies and daffodils. And look, they're blooming with the peaches and the pears and the apricots and the plums and the magnolias. You know, there's so many spring flowering and couple them with a carpet of daffodils underneath. And this is your garden next spring. At the time when I first took that picture, that was $150 worth of bulbs, probably now $200 worth of bulbs. Now, reach in your pocket. Do you have 200 bucks? I do. But would I spend it today? I think carefully about spending 200 bucks on plants. Um, I, you know, and I've got a lot of plants, so... You know, I don't want to duplicate unless I need to. I want something new and different. But in any event, did you go to a restaurant recently for dinner, bottle of wine, drinks? How much did you spend? How many hours of pleasure was that? Just think how many hours of pleasure this would give all of your neighborhood. You do garden in your front yard, don't you? I hope. You know, we can each possibly impact somebody else every day of our lives. Critter fruit plant. What plant family? Begins with an A, amaryllis, good for you. Lycogem, <laughs> crazy. Some taxonomists, I hope there are no taxonomists in the room, but if there are, just take this as a joke against you. But, you know, they named this one the nickname Summer Snowflake. Lycogem vernum, vernum is spring, <laughs> is the first one that is a spring bloomer. And then they named this one Oclogium astevum, that's summer. <laughs> Anyhow, one of the most critter proof plants. And I told you, plants like to sleep in a dry bed. Not all. This one doesn't mind wet situations. So I have a boggy area, and this one grows beautifully in the boggy area and uh, absolutely critter proof. Grows with the marsh marigolds quite nicely. Now, Somebody brought me marsh marigold. It turned out not to be. It turned out to be ranunculus vicaria. If you're from New England, terrible invasive plant, so they say there. It's a spring ephemeral, in my opinion. But look, I planted a liver, river of them in that bog. That's been there for 20 years like that. It continues to be beautiful every year. Now, the little tulip there with that anemone, the very one of the very earliest, and I love that combination of colors. I think that works well. The Lady Jane is a Clusiana type, which you have some nice plantings of here. It does tend to come back pretty well if it stays relatively dry, but planted with a late daffodil. Uh, yeah. Becky doesn't like promiscuous plants. So I don't mind polite promiscuous plants. As long as they ask permission, this one does receive the persicaria painter's palette, but I love the color echo I get with the tulip there, the double tulip. And if you want success with your tulips, plant them in your rock garden where the thyme loves to grow. Find an area, hot summer baking. We have a lot of berms in our gardens, and we've done them on purpose because the, little, the bulbs love growing in a berm type situation, but you see they love coming up through time. Um, the tulips do very well with the uh, Money plant and the and the mus, my sodas grow. They do beautifully with the spring flowering plums and uh, crab apples and and father gilla. They do beautifully coming up through. I've got a nice group of of uh, witch hazels which have relatively shallow roots. Well, the shallow roots help keep these dry in their summer dormancy, and they seem at win-win situation. Uh, bigger tulips, I really don't. I treat most tulips as annuals. So in a shady situation with the, with the dicentra and the, the brunera, you know, so what if they don't come back? But I love that green echo there. I love the, the pink echo with the tulip here with the painted fern. Um, I hope your street corner looks like that next spring in your neighborhood. You know, there are a couple hundred dollars worth of bulbs there. Um, now, hyacinthoides, we're into May now. These are the Spanish bluebells. You've been to England, you've seen the English bluebell, you fall in love with them. Don't try them here. They don't work in our climate. You want the Spanish bluebell. It works really well. It naturalizes, again, labeled by the Park Service and um, an invasive plant, but I don't think so. 
They're great blooming for the zellias. Uh, they come in white and blue and pink, and um, well, often fun. Another one member of this plant family, Ornithogallum star of Bethlehem, is to me an invasive plant. It, it not only reseeds everywhere, but it has a thousand bulblets per bulb, and it just it can infest your property. So we don't sell it, but we sell this one that's better behaved. And if you're if you use cut flowers, this one's a great cut flower as well. Um, and then Native American, I've mentioned many Native American bulbs, have I? They're not many. They're most of them are from the Pacific Northwest, at least marketable. Now, bloodroot, of course, is a Native American bulb, um, but it doesn't, uh, it's hard to market unless in a pot. Um, but this Kamasha, the new Sacagawea fed Lewis and Clark these when they were snowed into the into the had finished eating their horses and were on the way to starvation when they got into a, a blizzard and got snowed in. She went out and dug up Kamasha bulbs and roasted them and kept them from starving. I got to name one in her honor a while back. But it comes in white and blue and purple and pink. Uh, May blooming, uh, doesn't mind. It grows in wet meadows in Oregon, Washington, Idaho. Doesn't mind wet feet, so a great one. On the other hand, there are bulbs that grow up in Uzbekistan, Turkestan, Kazakhstan, high mountain deserts. They like cold winters. They like warm, wet springs, but absolutely dry summers. This Aramiris, the foxtail lily, the desert candle. Aren't those nicknames fun? Anyhow, um, they grow well on a berm with ornamental grasses coming up and hiding maturing foliage. Alliums, again, similar places they're coming from, typically um, high mountain deserts, but they're wonderful in mixed perennial borders. The perennials keep going and keep them dry. The alliums, many of them, there's some lovely plantings I've made here in the garden. The foliage this time of the year is attractive, but the time they get ready to bloom, the foliage turning brown. So it's really nice having the perennials come up and hide that maturing foliage. And in, in rose gardens, this is the Morris Arboretum. They have roses interspersed throughout their garden. But look, they put alliums with them. And it's rumored, now this is a rumor, it's not, don't say Brent told me so, but um, it's rumored that these have some pest resistance. They have some sort of odor they give off which repels uh, certain pests, anyhow. But I love alliums with non baptisia. And this is one coming back really well for me every year. I've got a nice collection of baptisias. I love them. And they're great with ornamental grasses. And yeah, this plant, Dracunculus vulgaris. I talked about fragrance, didn't I? Any of you have this in your garden? Oh, boy. This one has a fragrance of rotting meat. The day she's ready to get pollinated, she smells like carrion, rotting meat, and flies and carrion beetles pollinate her. But then it stops stinking. But a dramatic plant for your garden. Just don't plant her by your back door. And then this one, this one needs a little special help. It's a scylla, but it's a scylla with sizes of softball blooms. Great cut flower, but it has winter leaves. And because of the winter leaves, it needs a frost canopy. You have any frost canopies in your garden? They are on the south and east side of your garden, open to the sun, but they have evergreens over top. And if you limb those trees up, you get enough light for those leaves but it protects them from the thermal frost. And a wonderful one. That's a native, uh, native honeysuckle. And this one, yellow form, named for the botanist from Gloucester County, clerk of our court, John Clayton, who introduced a lot of native plants. Another Native American bulb, the Tritillaire from California, is lovely with the Asclepius tuberosa. We need more of that in our gardens. They, they, the Stella Dioro daylily, I guess people are a little tired of it, but in any event, it, it blooms well, but it's nice with the Diclostemma, another California native bulb. Um, so spring flowering bulbs are best planted when soil temperatures are between 50 and 60 degrees. When should that be here? October, November, and December. 
Again, don't plant them in August when Lowe's and Home Depot get them. And if you do buy them, make sure you keep them dry, dry, and dry. Don't, don't make them cold yet. It's the cool temperatures that cause them to root. Once they make their, their roots, the cell walls become elastic and they won't freeze. So we plant and don't do as we do, uh, do as I say do, because I planted bulbs, some bulbs still last week. But I get majority of the calls I get on my phone. I answer all the customers' horticultural questions. You call the business, they'll refer you to me with a horticultural question. Please don't apologize. I like people. I like to talk and I like to share. In any event, um, it, I, I get a lot of calls this time of the year, people who discovered bulbs they didn't plant. And if you do have some, any of you in that category, go home today and plant them this afternoon. They will not store for another year. Uh, you need to get them in the ground. And they may have aborted their blooms, not thinking they were going to be able to keep going. But go ahead and plant them, and they, if they put up green leaves, yes. Um, well, OK, not now. It's too late for that. They do need that, but that brings something up. They do need that cold period to trigger them to bloom. And, um, and typically, if you've held them in a garage all winter where it was uniformly cool, that's OK. Inside, they, wouldn't, they would have aborted their blooms already, OK? Let's plant ridiculous stem up right now this afternoon, <laughs> along with the um, tigridia. What will happen? And sweetheart, let's hope that the tigridia is maybe a little bit too cool still. It's South African bulb. It likes warmer temperatures. I'm about to switch to the summer flowering bulbs. So, um, but perhaps um, it would grow. They'd bloom at different times for sure. Okay. So spring flowering bulbs, bulbs, corms, tubers, rhizomes, tubers, roots, lots of funny looking uh, organisms. Those true bulbs are pointy end up, the others uh, try to determine, and our planting instructions give you pretty detailed information. These bulbs, we're beginning to ship now to warmer climates. These are the summer flowering bulbs. Many of these are tropical to semi-tropical. Some are hardy bulbs like lilies, absolutely hardy. It's just they're held over the winter, frozen, and we ship them to you. We take them out of the freezer to ship them to you because they spread very quickly. Make sure you plant them right away as soon as you get home. Lilies go not three times the height deep, but four times. They make stem roots above the bulb. They make roots underneath, but they make roots above the bulb too. In any event, a lot of the tropicals may not be hardy, totally hardy for you but you put them in the right microclimate and they fool you sometimes. Others, all of these grow well in containers. Remember with containers, when you plant a bulb, you plant a bulb three times the height deep in soil, but in a container you want three times the height of the bulb with soil under the bulb. So don't do it the same way you do in the ground because they want plenty of room for those roots to spread out. And I do say soil, not peat moss, not potting mix. Better a soil with composted bark and compost, and it can have some peat moss, but don't use a seedling mix. Use the mix with some structure to it, the best. But in any event, plant them beginning now. Do you believe everything you read? Hopefully not on the damn web. I, I do Facebook every day, and if you like, I post pictures of my garden every day, and I enjoy, I love the comments people send and the questions they give me. But in any event, I see a lot of things people post and it, and it ain't so. I don't know, I wish somebody were there to monitor. But also books used to have editors, but the editor didn't read this book I had read, read about Flotilla. A hardy terrestrial orchid from Japan. But it said they were shade loving. So what did I do? I put it in my shade garden and it works pretty well. I get a few blooms and it's great with the oxalis. It's great with the... With a, um, you know, that's named for somebody named Mr. Hauk, not Mr. Huke. Why do we call it Heukera? <laughs> Anyhow, um, I keep going. But look what Becky, Becky didn't read the same book. She put hers in the bald sunlight. <laughs> look how many blooms she gets. Oh, um, in any event, I have a vole patrol, Daffy and Dilly, or they're in vole heaven now, but in cat heaven. But any event, 
I used to train them. When they bring me a vole, I'd give them a kitty treat. So in any event. But I love shade gardens and you know, Lysimachia runs around. It's pretty promiscuous, right? Do you grow Lysimachia, Numeria aurea, that little thing there? Used to be sold as a house plant, but it, it's awesome. And Oxalis is so wonderful. And I love the pulmonarias and I love the Oxalis. I love all these things together. And I, I love the carpet. And the Oxalis is so amazing. Do you know they're hardy plants, but they're great house plants also? Did you know that? And very little eat them. This Oxalis triangularis doesn't like to be in the sunlight because it often gets stressed and gets a rust, but in the shade, it tends to be just fine. So we keep going. Now, dahlias. I didn't plant dahlias, you had to stake them. I didn't have time to stake plants in my garden. So I discovered a breeder breeding shorter dahlias. And when I plant the dahlias this time of the year, and you know, anytime soil temperature above 50 degrees, it's great for planting dahlias. You can get some nice May bloom if you plant them early. But uh, I disturb the soil, so what do I do? Lots of lettuce seeds, I plant lettuce seeds around them. Um, now, I love the taller dahlias as long as there's something to help hold them up, but I sow larks per seeds in the fall. And, uh, you know, they're a biennial, they're dirt sheep. Now, lilies. Lilies were my second favorite plant. Now, unfortunately, they've lost out to a, not a bulb, but a shrub. Uh, camellias are now my second favorite. I have 200 and some varieties of camellias. Start in September, and they, we don't sell camellias, but I still have them in full bloom. But that little lily is a pot lily. It's an Asiatic, it's an early bloomer. It only grows a foot tall. They're great on pots. I love this uh, Landini with the color echo with Perilla and Rudbeckia. The Perilla Becky doesn't allow in her. You grow Perilla? Those dark leaves, that mint relative and annual. It seeds everywhere, but I don't mind. It fills my garden. Now, any of you, how many of you, you do hippie astrums at Christmas time, right? You call them amaryllis, but they're not really amaryllis. They're from South America. But did you know they're hardy plants in your garden? too, and this is Becky's garden. Now, if you don't buy them all, this is what sometimes happens to Becky's garden, or John and Adrian <laughs> bring some back to their gardens. Uh, dahlias. This was a dahlia breeder who bred dahlias that bloomed all summer, as long as it wasn't too hot. Most dahlias do best in September, October, and November, when the weather begins to cool. And uh, dahlias are cut and come again. Daffodils are pick one time, they don't rebloom, lilies don't rebloom, but dahlias rebloom if because if they don't go to seed, they think they need to continue to bloom. So we love them. They're these particular the gallery series are nice and compact and full of flowers. Forever Susan, did they name this one for anyone here in the room? Um, that'd be nice to say, wouldn't it? But Virginia Tech colors, so and then we sell a, another one, BT Spirit, with those colors. But a, not a real lily, a, a ditch lily. Do you know ditch lilies or graveyard lilies or outhouse lilies or hemerocallis? <laughs> I don't know. Nobody's shaking their fist at me yet. But anyhow, um, I love the colocations, the elephant ears. Now, there are a few of these that are pretty promiscuous, but they're runners. We try not to sell any runners. We try to sell the clumpers. They are very moisture tolerant. But look at what they're doing with this. All illusions of shadow with all dark leaves together. Uh, kind of fun. I love the Xantodesias. You know, 10% of the world's plants grow in South Africa. And this was the one that came from South Africa. These are wonderful. Calla lily, their nickname. Had beautiful foliage. You'll see it better in some of the others later. But interspersed with some larkspur. Great long-lasting cut flowers. Um, now, my orgy garden, you know, want a little bit of everything in bed together. I like a promiscuous native plant. Do any of you grow Pycnanthemum muticum, the mountain mint? Well, of course, there are some versions of Pycnanthemum that are not as promiscuous. This one is stoloniferous like most mints. Pycnanthemum virginicum is not, and I'm hoping we're going to offer that as a plug. We sell a lot of perennial plugs, deep plugs, which you plant and mature in one season. And uh, the crinum, another amaryllis. And again, 
take the old flowers off and it reblooms. They are wonderful in the garden and fragrant. And then this plant, Native American plant, native to Mexico and south southwest, but Mirabilis, proper name. And they mistakenly give plants wrong nicknames. They call this one four o'clock. I never had one bloom at four o'clock, so we renamed it eight o'clock. It blooms in the evening as light goes down and blooms all night. The evening pollinators adore it. Um, Native American bulb, Leatris. We took it, as Holl took it to Holland and it turned out to be one of the favorite cut flowers there. So the tubers are this, a dirt cheap. You can buy a hundred for 30 bucks, I think. And you can buy a pot of it in the garden center for 20 bucks, <laughs> but you can buy a hundred of them. What, I'm sorry? Oh, I don't know. Anyhow, the um, it's great because it's an incredible pollinator plant and um, it blooms, interestingly, from the top of the stem down instead of from the bottom up. Oh, they gone, turned it off. Oh, okay, and it comes in nice white color as well. So now, um, we love the ferns and this is a fern we've just uh, become enamored with. The, the ostrich fern, and then the early lily, the martagons, are the most shade tolerant of all the lilies. Wonderful fragrance, uh, much smaller flowers, the flower the size of a silver dollar instead of a baseball or, or softball. I had to go to Thailand one year, and one nice Thai lady speaking to me in Thai, I was there with a friend who fortunately spoke English, grabbed my hand to show me something behind her house. She was pulling me and talking to me in Thai. He was trying to translate. And we saw this elephant ear, this colocasia. You know, colocasias have the stem attached to the center of the leaf. Uh, the upright elephant ear, more the alocasia, it's to the edge of the stem of the leaf. But in any event, this one is mutated and it holds a whole cup of water. And I asked when it was asked what she called it, she said teacups. And so we took it to a tissue culture lab. Most of our tropicals are grown as little plugs in tissue culture and sent to us. We grow them in a greenhouse, you'll see in a little while, without any chemicals. We fertigate with compost tea. We use biological insects and all, but um, any event. This another mojito is a happy camper in a pond or somewhere else. All of the colocations are very moisture tolerant. Get them started in the pot and you'll get a plant from us that the leaves will be a foot or so tall that it'll be in a square pot and you put that in some soil, tease the roots apart, uh, put a little gravel around the top of the soil and you can sink it in a pond. It's a happy camper growing in your water garden. Cannas are one of the most cost of you know, there's a lot of bang for your buck with cannas. Unfortunately, majority have some viruses that are debilitating. These two seem to be resistant with that illusion of shadow, but look at the different contrast in the leaves there. We think that's so important. My, my garden, that's what I garden for, is the flowers are the icing on the cake. The cake is what's the, there for all season. So the cake on that Australia and on, on um. Praetoria, to me, are awesome. And I'm getting a nice color echo with a lovely um, uh, uh, Camasiparis or whatever behind, which is gold-tinted. Eucomus from South Africa. Incredible, long-lasting summer bulb. The pollinators love it. Great cut flower. And uh, it's an amazing grade on, growing on pots also. Uh, the Sprachelia, South American Amaryllis. Uh, you'd have to grow this one. If you wanted it to come back, grow it in a pot and store it. Just keep it from freezing over the winter in a garage. Um, but don't, uh, you know, aside from that, just repot it in the spring and bring it back out. Amazing, lovely. Palladium's the most tender of all the bulbs and I don't recommend trying to save them at all. The Sorumatum venosum, another dramatic one that's coming back in our garden, but you grow it for the leaves. Um, but the caladiums are heat sensitive or cold sensitive. The soil needs to be over 60 degrees before you plant them or plant them on pots ahead of time and then take them out when soil temps are warmer. But um, amazing shade tolerant, critter resistant plants. Now my 
midsummer morning orgy garden. You see, I put everything in bed together. Um, that's why Becky calls it the orgy garden. Um, but I like it. I like the the look. I like the fun. I even like that big old Arendo Donax that peppermint stick. Galtonia, another South African bulb, interesting and fun for the summer garden. Zephyranthes, some of these are native to the south of the U.S. and the uh, Bahama or the, the Caribbean area. The nickname for these, rain lily. Every time we got a thunderstorm in the, in the later summer, the ozone from the thunderstorm, they say, is what triggers them to bloom again. But they bloom every time after a a good thunderstorm that comes through. The guy Gustashi, amazing perennial, uh, incredible pollinator plant, great there with some uh, Mullenbergia, a nice color echo again. The Polyanthes, incredible Native American plant, native in Mexico, but the fragrance is amazing. This is a plant we do in, in nursing home gardens because Several things that seniors who are losing their memories always remember. It's Becky sings when we go to nursing home gardens and she'll start singing and playing and it's amazing. They'll join her in song and yet they've forgotten how to talk. But we take them out into the garden and their heads come up when they smell the polyanthes. They remember fragrances also. So two important things. And I do say I've been reading, I read a lot of medical newsletters. They say music is a great therapy for any event. Um, the later lilies, the oriental trumpet hybrids are marvelous with ornamental grasses. I grow, um, again, a vegetable I grow is radicchio, radicchio. I spread the seeds and when it blooms, it's chicory. Um, um, Becky's garden later in the summer with the dahlia. This is September. I was mums, September and October. Um, I love the elephant ears, these black-leaved, glossy-leaved ones. Uh, nothing eats them. They are long-lasting, but they're great. The contrast of the ornamental grasses is fun. Now, another amaryllis that we grow ourselves in Virginia is the Lycoris radiata, Japanese amaryllis, fall bloomer. Uh, they call them spider lilies in Japan, British soldiers in Williamsburg, hurricane lilies down on the coast of North and South Carolina. Uh, we call them naked gentlemen because they often follow the naked ladies, which I'll show you in a minute, which is another like Horace, but from China. Um, I love the, the fall blooming. You know, the dahlias do their best in September, October, November when the night's cool, and the monarchs love those single flowers. These are the naked ladies, resurrection lilies, surprise lilies, fun names. They're not lilies at all. Why do we call so many plants lilies that have nothing to do with the lily family? Um, and this is an amaryllis bred to a crinum lily, and oh, awesome in the fall garden. And there's Becky. Um, I am blessed. I'm married well, and you know she's enabled me to do what I love doing. I've lectured now in every state except North Dakota and Hawaii, and I, I still enjoy it a lot. I like people. Um, and if you want saffron, the most expensive spices, you buy Crocus sativus and plant it on your rock garden. This is one that likes to stay hot and dry in the summertime, but it's those red pistols that you harvest. Now beware, if you don't want your ink, finger and thumb to turn bright orange, wear a pair of gloves, because it, it's, it stains also, but uh, it's fun. Now fall blooming crocuses bloom when the leaves begin to come off the trees. We have ones that bloom all winter long. We always have something, some bulb flower in bloom. People mistakenly call these autumn crocuses, no relationship whatsoever. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, if you have gout, you'd be treated with a drug called colchicine, extracted from the bulb of this, a uh, relatively toxic chemical, but it amazingly protects bulbs from being eaten. Um, if you've ever uh, jibbed a camellia, you know what you do? You take the bud off the camellia and, and you put a, some gibrilic acid in. <laughs> the flower will be two or three times as big. Um, and it's kind of fun. But these are fun fall bloomers, September, October, November. And they are great with artemisia foliage. Now, 
You want to plant a mess of bulbs in your yard? And you have a bulb planting party. And here's a piece of concrete reinforcing wire, the stuff that's in the slab, those six inch squares. Just mark the soil with that, put a bulb on each, have a few Bloody Marys and, and hors d'oeuvres to share. And uh, then you hire the local vendor of compost to come in and cover them with compost and some mulch. And next spring, here's your cloud of daffodils in your yard. And if you come to visit, you may like to come to an Airbnb like this one where uh, both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson used to visit relatives and friends called uh, Warner Hall. But, uh, and this is little John. That's Becky, and that's little John. Little John is six foot 11, and he runs our business in Holland. He contracts with all the growers who grow our bulbs. This is son Jay, the next generation, the fourth generation. This is his bulb planting machine. It lifts up six inches of turf with roots intact. It, it folds it back, the hopper holds several thousand bulbs, and uh, here he is planting at a church, and there it is the next spring. So oh, just they work well in turf. It doesn't, it has to be, have some root structure to be able to work. My orgy garden, yes. I'm sorry? Yeah, but you see, that's different. You're hand placing the bulbs and then covering. That's the no holes method. What kind of compost? Oh, yard waste compost. Yard waste compost, wood, wood waste, uh, leaf waste, that's all been composted. Most municipalities do it and have it available for a very reasonable price. Um, now, uh, Becky and I married. We didn't, we'd each had a starter marriage. We didn't have any money, so we tore down three barns, warehouse, an old house, and we built that. We raised our kids there. Becky pinches Mr. Lincoln pretty well. And we, our accountant told us, told her she should build the house of her dreams. So we turned around and did that. And that's now an Airbnb. Sleeps 11. So bring a whole group of you up and spend a weekend at the hodgepodge house. This is my garden and part of my daffodil field where I grow lots of things in bed together. And um, this is what it looks like in the early spring. But... Four or five months later, this is what the same garden looks like. Remember lasagna? Plant your garden like lasagna. Plants don't mind being in layers. Bulbs in particular is part of the layers. So um, that's my orge, what Becky calls my orgy garden in the summer. Does it look like that was 10 years ago? Does it look like that now? I've planted a lot of shrubs and shrubs get bigger and garden is always changing. It's a movable feast. Now, George owned our property, but he never slept there. That is Washington. He took it as collateral on a loan. It wasn't, uh, it had an old tobacco barn. And uh, that's where our business was until we moved out to where it is today. And I now have a, a I collect stuff. Becky has another S word for all the things I collect, but um, until I display them. But in any event, I have a woodworking shop also. We produce 12 artists are working in my woodworking shop, producing all kinds of amazing things. But this is my garden there in the spring, and this is the same garden in the summer. So you see, garden like lasagna, and uh, you know, we're blessed to be gardeners. What we do positively impacts everyone who sees what we do. It's good for our health, good for our minds, um, but it, it, it does impact other people. You know, we can each help somebody else every day of our lives. So one way to do so is to plant bulbs and harvest smiles. So thank you very much for being here today. And I did go quickly. A couple of you asked, answered, asked questions. And if more do, please come up to me afterwards. But again, and come to visit us. Our Daffodil Festival is this coming weekend. No, no, next week after next weekend. Uh, we're having a daffodil festival in town, and it's a it's a grand occasion. There'll be the country's largest daffodil show, but there'll be many vendors of things, and it's a wonderful time. We're near Williamsburg, so plant bulbs and harvest smiles, and thank you for having me.
Well, this, it's telling me I have to be here at noon to Ronaldo. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't program it very well. But. Well, thank everyone for coming in. I hope you really enjoyed the, the talk. And definitely look up Brent and Becky. Um, thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, that's Bucks, a bottle up and I didn't have a switch. Go in to bloomingbucks.com, which is a different way to get to the website. But you do that and you pick 